Hello, hello, Martin. How are you today? I'm well, Ralph. How are you? I'm very good. Welcome to another episode of The Loom Plotters. And which episode is this? This is episode nine. Is it nine? Already number nine? We are already on number nine. Isn't that amazing? Wow, how, how the time flies. Absolutely. So, what are you wearing on your wrist today, Martin? Well, um, first, do you want to say what we're talking about today? What, what's, what's the topic for today? All right. Topics today is standards. Both from a functional perspective as well as from a... Um, beautification standard yeah right? aesthetic perspective as well aesthetic. to a certain extent yeah all right we'll so in this vein everything in this vein i have chosen my watch for today um it is my most or i should say it is the most uh effective timekeeper that i have so to speak it is uh it holds time to the highest standard in my collection wow um, and it is the oh. G-Shock, <laughs> the Casio G-Shock GW5000U, um, which of course is a Japan-only um, model. This is the the one that is the closest to the original um, uh, 1983 version with the screw-down case back. It has a full steel construction with the rubber uh, put on top of the steel construction as opposed to the modern ones which have a resin or plastic case with rubber over it so it's a much more um oh. robust watch and of course the quartz movement in this is fairly reliable um it's not one of the most reliable quartz movements we'll talk about some standards for quartz movements as well or or some time constraints that quartz time pieces can uh can uh, keep oh yeah but this one's around plus minus 15 seconds a month is what they claim so, let's say half a second a day right it's oh. roughly half a second yeah. a day hmm. um however because this is the radio frequency based movement this means if i were to live in an area that would have this radio signal which i think there's six places in the world that that emit this radio signal Basically, um, every day you would pick up a radio signal, an atomic radio signal, uh, and it would set your watch to this atomic clock. Yep. Um, unfortunately, in UAE, we do not have this. I think the closest one we have is either the European one or the Japanese one. I think it's what? Europe, Japan, China, Germany. Uh, and the US. Europe, Germany. Uh, I said Europe and Germany, but Germany specifically within yeah. europe so we have um, one one US. In, yeah there's there's six i think it's uh, six bands usually uh, the, the yes, most correct. ones they have so it's right here on the yeah. dial multi-band six yeah and six bands means uh, we have six different different transmitters in the world um yes one is in germany that's correct and then we have one in uh, the uk then we have one in uh, the united states in Colorado, and I think we have two in China or two in Japan. I'm not so sure, but there's a definitely I think in both. Japan and there's China. There's China and Japan, but I think one of the countries has two transmitters because of the size uh, or the mountainous uh, terrain. I don't know. So, exactly. so this is kind of an interesting way to attack the idea of okay, our watch might not be the most accurate in terms of its timekeeping, but if we were to set it every single day, mm. then you minimize your overall losses. When we do an episode about about quartz watches, then I can talk a lot about that, about um, assisted quartz. This is considered assisted quartz, right? Because mm -hmm. it's not yeah. um, it's not in the, in the in the movement itself the precision. It's basically just in the correction, right? So like your yeah, like exactly. your iPhone is basically um, an atomic clock more or less it's a stratum 2 level i think so that means the iphone is correcting itself based on apple's um, time service um i think a couple of times every day every two three hours it just syncs itself up so it's usually about a few hundredths of a second or a few tenths of a second from the um, atomic clock so it's a very precise mm -hmm. watch yeah same of course with your um Casio and some of the Casios that have this Bluetooth connection, they can also do that and connect to your phone a couple of day times a day, three or four times, I think four times I think they do that, and then sync up 
with your phone. So, so I had yeah. this one, but it was per request. So for me, it only synced, sunk, sunk, synced. Yeah, they have a new app. Um, every time oh. I connected, right? So no, was uh, there was no automatic push signal for mine. I think I think um, the G GMW B five thousand at least, and I think they have a pretty similar module. So that's the one Not I the had, same. and it uh, and that uh, does it automatically. No, every no, the GMW B five thousand is yeah. the one I had. And right. it would only sync it when I would physically go into the application. No, um, so mine, I don't know mine, if... mine does that also um, without that. And I can show you this. I have one here. Oh, you're wearing yours. No, I'm not wearing it. No. I'm wearing something else. But <laughs> it's, it shows yeah, Yours there... says that it's received the signal. Exactly. So if, uh, uh, when your phone is close by at 6.30 in the morning, because that's when it happens, and then 12.30, and then I think it's another time in the afternoon. Really? Because for, for Every me, six it hours, never... Yeah, exactly. It never Four once did it. No, it, so it I'm not does sure what way. I... Anyhow, they have a new app, so you need to install a new app now because now it will sync with that and maybe it works then. You can set this up. I, I okay. sold mine. Oh, so, okay then. Okay. <laughs> this is the one that's coming up in the auction, <laughs> the exact one you just held up. <laughs> all right. The all silver uh, GMW B5000. Yeah. Um, so I am putting that up in Timepiece 360 auction. So for you guys okay. that are... Paying attention to these auctions, you will see it come up. Um, it, it's a fantastic watch, but unfortunately, there's one small niggle that I have with it: is that it was uh, slightly there, there's no articulation on the end links, and uh, therefore it does require yeah. a little bit of a larger wrist as opposed to the regular resin G shocks mm. or the um, uh, rubber ones, which forms your wrist True. very very nicely. All, All right. right, now so you, what, what are I'm you wearing? wearing Ralph? I am wearing my Omega Seamaster 300. Blue dial with the Setna Gold two tone thingy. I got Beautiful it under watch. a rubber rubber strap and then bought the. Only, yeah, but why? Metal, why did uh, you strap. not keep it on the rubber? Why did you put it onto the the bracelet right oh, now? Oh, just summer. Sometimes I just like the bracelet. Yeah, yeah. so it's so just I, I switch willy nilly. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I love just... that watch, and specifically, I think those rubber straps that the Omega Masters come with are some of the best straps, if not the best straps in the world. They're very smart designed. They have, you know, the, the one keeper that is fixed, the other keeper that's that's uh, uh, loose that you can move. It's it's really well done and the quality is really nice. I, I totally yep. agree. The, the construction is fantastic. And of course, it comes with a nice uh, matching buckle then, of course, which is also quite nice with the Omega logo. Yeah, and I think so, they're fantastic. Yeah. yeah. I, I was just telling you that yeah. I was looking at these in the store the other day. Mm. I went in and they had a beautiful model that I haven't seen. <clears throat> As you guys know from from our previous episode, I don't like date windows. And that's one of the things that has been keeping me from getting a Seamaster 300M. Um, and I know that there's a few varieties without date windows, including the new James Bond yes. um, 60th anniversary, which is stunning. Um, but they apparently have a one with a titanium bezel. So apparently it's a stainless steel watch with a titanium bezel. It had a gray dial, red uh, secondhand red Seamaster logo, I believe. And it looked great. And it had no date. So that to me, that now we're now we're in the, the ballpark. Now we're talking. Mm. So But don't you think this is the uh, is this the Necton edition? I'm I'm not so sure. Anyhow. Let's look not at, sure. Look well, at, what look is it, it called? Up for the next one. Necton, the, I, I believe the Necton, N E K N E K T O N, right? Yeah, correct. Um, because it's, Master. It's, it's really nice. Yes, that is correct. That is it is the Necton edition. Mm, yeah, that's um, lovely. I didn't know that this was a, a, a special edition um, or, or any specific edition. Hey, it's but Omega. Was, it's always a special limited. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Omega does do a lot of these, but this is exactly the one that I saw. And uh, it's yeah. weird because it's like a bead blasted uh, titanium bezel. So it's uh -huh. not polished, it's not brushed. It's like, you know, as if you were to take some kind of abrasive, you know, bead blaster and just blast the heck out of it. Okay. Um, it, it's a super good looking um, watch. So if you guys are interested, look it up. It's called the Necton N-E-K-T-O-N edition, SEMA Master 300. And it's cool. It's very nice. Um, I, I liked it. Yeah. So It's very good, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Specifically on the black rubber strap. Yeah, and this is also, of course chronometer certified so yeah the the neck down that i was trying on had this rubber strap the black rubber strap mm -hmm. and it was it was actually a fantastic looking watch and the the bezel as i was mentioning had this bead blasting effect so it wasn't brushed it wasn't polished it was just kind of 
um, this grainy texture and it looked super cool. So highly, highly recommend it. So if you guys want to check it out, it's called the Nekton M-E-K-T-O-M um, edition Seamaster. And apparently Nekton is a company that uh, works with um, uh, the ocean, saving the ocean or something along those lines, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah, it's it's a pretty cool looking I think watch. It's, and I, it's I, a kind of a diving watch, um, diving, no, oh, sorry, not diving watch, diving Equipment manufacturer or something. I'm not 100% sure. Who, Nekton? Yeah, anyhow. It, uh, maybe I'm completely, let's see. completely so, wrong. So first and foremost, Nekton is, is a type of animal that swims freely. Not plankton? No, Nekton. Nekton. So Nekton right. is the classification <laughs> for animals that swim, apparently. Okay. But I'm curious what, what the brand Nekton does. Ah, uh, but anyhow, so you knows, like that watch, and discovering I think it's very, the reefs. very beautiful. Yeah, yeah it's, it's it's for me once again. It comes down to the fact that it doesn't have a uh, date window, but, and I think that 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 means a lot to me. But I think the date window on this on the Seamaster 300 M is is really nice because it's at six o'clock. It is in a dial color. It really blends in. It doesn't you know scream, "Hey, look at me, I'm the date." So it's it's nice. It's balanced. You will never convert me <laughs> ever, ever. Okay, uh, okay. If possible, always no date window. All right. So, all right. But, um, but, so your watch that you're wearing, not the Nekton that you like, but the watch that you're wearing is the G -Shock. The G -Shock, is not a chronometer certified quartz watch. No, it is not. It, and as it, I mentioned, the Nekton is not just chronometer. It's it's uh, Meta yeah, certified, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like mine too. It's the uh, it's the Omega 8800 movement in it. And it's also a master, master, master chronometer. chronometer, which is a different standard. But let's go back to exactly. the original standard of chronometer. Why okay. would you let's even talk standards. need a chronometer? Let's go well, back let's, to this. Well, let's, let's talk back... Back in the day, I, I do like doing history lessons, right? So I have this quick history lesson here. Um, so imagine you are um, in the 1700s, 1800s. You're on a boat and you are sailing the ocean. You are uh, trying to circumnavigate the globe or whatever it is that you want to do. Um, uh, the issue is, that you have to rely on a timekeeping device to navigate, right? That's the only navigation mm -hmm. method that we have. So the issue becomes, how do we know that your clock is holding accurate time? Um, what do we compare it against, right? We have to do something to make sure that your clock is telling you that if I sail one hour in this direction, and then you're actually sailing for one hour in that direction, as opposed to an hour and a half, right? So this was the big issue is we had all kinds of clockmakers with all kinds of different quote unquote standards that they would use. Mm -hmm. um, so generally speaking, if you made a portable clock or a watch, um, you would have to compare it against, if you're a watchmaker, you would compare it against the largest clock that you had because the larger the item, the larger the clock, the more accurate it is. Um, as we know, these big uh, you know, grandfather style clocks or wall clocks or whatever you want to call them, they had um, pendulums, right? They had pendulums that would uh, act as the timekeeping device within the clock. Mm -hmm. um, now in watches, these are miniaturized. Um, the larger the pendulum, the more accurate the clock. Um, so you reducing this um, makes the watch less efficient, not efficient, but less uh, uh, precise. So they would then make a small pocket watch and then compare it to the big clock that they had in their you know, workshop. If it was holding the same time, they would say, okay, this is a well-made pocket watch and they would sell it. Um, of course, this is not very precise standards. Yeah. So on, and that's on, when the Swiss- On the boats, they had these big marine chronometers. They still do yes. to a certain extent. They still do. They still have a yeah. backup, right? Even even the biggest, biggest ships have still a mechanical backup. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. so that's not necessarily what they're using. to. So they would still rely on pocket watches and others. And the, the marine chronometer would be there to make sure that your pocket watch and other timekeeping devices were holding mm. accurate time, right? So uh, the marine chronometer 
was a big a big item, right? Yep. Generally, it lived down in the hull of the ship or, or in a, an safe. office somewhere mm-hmm. it, it, where it was safe. It was not up on the deck where you would be most likely you know, piloting or driving the, the ship from either. And getting wet or exposed to the elements or even just, to, uh, you know, exactly. just uh, rolling so much in, on the sea. Correct, mm-hmm. correct. So, um, so this is all, of course, you know, once again, just a, a step to try to make watches more reliable. So then the Swiss come around um, and they start doing what they called uh, chronometer trials or, or Swiss observatory trials were the, mm-hmm. were, were the actual name. There were a number of Swiss observatories that would basically check to see if your clock was running correctly or your watch was running correctly. Um, and they did this for quite some time. Um, basically, they had a whole bunch of standards that they would check. Um, these, these trials would run like 45 to 50 days of them checking movements mm-hmm. to make sure that these movements were accurate. Um, and of course, uh, it, it, people say that they were more strict than the modern standards are, by the way. So they would do this for 45, 50 days, make sure everything is A-OK. And they would basically rank or rate um, or give their seal of approval, let's say, to certain manufacturers. Um, now, this was all fun and great. It was it was in, you know, enjoyable. They had a good time. The Swiss were you know, competing against themselves um, up until the 60s, uh, late 60s. Um, and that's when Seiko came around. Mm-hmm. And Seiko entered the first one, I think it was like 1965 um, it was, something around those times. Um, they placed like 188th. Nobody cared. They said, ha ha, look at the Japanese. They, um, they're not very good. Mm. Next year, they were like 150th. In 1968, they actually won the top three places. Yep. Um, needless to say, There was no Swiss observatory trials in 1969. So basically, that was, a, that was a, a competition that was open for everybody who wanted to um, put watches It forward was. and say, like, here, and, I and want I to think the get Swiss, into the trials. Yeah. And, and the Swiss were not very pleased that they weren't winning. Yeah, I can imagine. And hence, they canceled the whole <laughs> trials. Um, but, right. but of course, this was the rise of, of the Quartz Watch. 1968 was um, Seiko entered three Quartz Watches, and it just... It didn't just beat. I mean, it annihilated mm-hmm. all the Swiss watches because once again, quartz is such a more precise timekeeping uh, method than a regular mechanical movement. Yeah. So it wasn't even even close. So uh, that's when the Swiss decided to shut down these trials. So now since then, uh, we've developed new types of, um, of standards for us to measure movements to make sure that uh, people have an idea of how accurate their watches are. And, uh, you know, the most famous of which is, of course, COSC, which is the Swiss standard of, of chronometers. Mm-hmm. So you want to talk about this uh, and go into these different standards? Yeah. You want me to talk about the first two and I'll, I'll yeah, yeah, you'll sure, talk about sure, the others sure. or how do you want to do it? COSC stands for Control uh, Officiel Suisse de Chronometrie. Chronometer. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, exactly. And that uh, uh, for, was formed in 73, so 50 years ago uh, in its current form. And um, yeah, I mean, if you want to give a bit of an overview for that, then that's, that's fine. So, so for, the as far as I know, <laughs> later. Um, so once again, in order for a watch to have the word chronometer um, written on the dial, or to be considered a chronometer movement, um, do you have to rem- uh, send this movement and test it, right? Um, I, I believe every single movement this chronometer certified has to be tested. So it's not like a bulk testing where you randomly select one or two, like quality control. Um, you have to test every single movement. Yep. And those movements are tested in different positions. Basically, what this means, you might have seen this written somewhere. It says, you know, tested to five positions, tested to eight positions. Um, this means um, the orientation of the watch. Mm-hmm. So generally, we have dial up, dial down, um, crown up, crown down, and so forth and so yeah. forth, right? Any way you can yeah, put the watch. Five, five positions, um, yeah. Five, is it Close, five? Yeah. What's the fifth? Crown up, crown down, uh, dial mm-hmm. up, dial down. 
And I have one more. I don't know. It's five different positions. That's what the test says. At three, three oh, different and then we have twelve up, yeah. twelve up, six down. Yeah, six. So, so we we would we would that's six right there immediately, right? So then you can do all kinds of variations on this. Uh, but the thing is, your watch has to run between minus four and plus six seconds a day. And that, if you perform within those standards, and I believe you have to be Swiss made as well, um, yeah, that's, then that's you one could of the, be given one of the biggest things. Only watches that are assembled and produced in Switzerland can get the chronometer certification from COSC. And we have watches from all price points that are chronometer certified. Um, you know, from the from the expensive ends, we have you know uh, all kinds of. So Omegas, as we mentioned yeah. before, so as you said, used to be chronometer. As you said, there's two different cost standards, of course. There's one for mechanical watches and one for quartz watches. For quartz watches, it's a bit, uh, of course, much tighter than as for mechanical watches. But you can also have your quartz watch chronometer certified. Breitling does that, for example. All of their quartz watches are chronometer certified quartz watches. So there's also a standard for quartz watches from, from COSC. Really? Yeah, I didn't know that there it was is. different standards. Yeah, 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 I thought it was the all the same. The average daily rate uh, is uh, at a specific temperatures, the 23 degrees, and I think it's a plus minus 0 0.07 seconds a day of uh, deviation. And we'll, we'll get yeah. into this as well, about how much better, technically speaking, qu quartz movements are can than be. mechanical. <laughs> can, can, can be, be. exactly, because <laughs> some are not. Yeah. But uh, so anyway, yeah, so we had this minus 4 to plus 6, um, this, you know, we have, we have, as I mentioned, Tissot's that are chronometer certified, yes. um, you know, for $500, euros, whatever. Um, but then we have watches that are $10,000, $20,000 that are also chronometer certified. So this is truly a, uh, a good standard for, uh, for movements. But the issue is. These are movements by themselves. They're not in a watch. So the entire watch is still not tested. Right? So so that's correct. When yeah. you case something together, um, especially when you have, you know, a screw down case back, for instance, you're screwing in this movement, you apply a slight pressure to the movement, and all of a sudden, all of these standards are yeah. out the window. See a lot a lot, now a lot can happen uh before the watch is actually in a in uh, sorry, the movement is actually in the watch. So Usually, when you send your movement to COSC, you you put it even in a with a like a service dial or even service hands and stuff like that. So you actually have a raw movement. You send it there. It's being tested for fifteen days. It gets a certificate, and you send it and it come come back, and then you take off the you know whatever the dial that you used for that uh, because you don't want anything to get damaged either, right? Because you know for these these parts, so. You take this all off, and then uh, it's uh, and then you put it in a in a in the watch itself in the case. Put your new dial on and the hands and all of the stuff. So there is a lot that can happen in this time, and that's what you were aiming for, right? To say, yeah, exactly. These are the movements so, tested, um, but not the final product. So what? what okay, so now what was one step further than cost? Mm -hmm. Um, so basically there's, we'll talk about the, the official one, but first let's mention the fact that Rolex, if you, if you read the dial, um, of any Rolex model, modern Rolex model, it will always say superlative chronometer, right? Yes. So this means they are cost certified. Correct. However, they are better and they exceed cost certifications. And Rolex is generally around between minus two and plus two seconds a day, which is oh, that's what they very, guarantee. very good, good uh, dial, except for my wife's little Oyster Perpetual, which was running at like plus 30 seconds a day. And then we had to adjust it. Uh, but once again, when, once it was adjusted, yeah, it ran it to this day. It's running. It's been, I think we just did it about I don't know, four, three, four months ago. Um, and now it's running minus 0.1 seconds a day. Yeah. Which is ridiculous. It is. It is amazing um, of how precise these watches are. But again, Rolex actually guarantees you that it's between minus two and plus two. On, and I do on have to average. say they fixed it for free. Yeah, of course. They, they have. They guarantee it, it within but five. But this watch is out of warranty. Uh, oh, that's very nice. To this do, watch yeah. is 10 years old. Mm. So they still 
fixed it. But anyway, um, so one thing that I do want to mention here is, of course, sending your watch or movement to be cost certified costs money. Correct. So even Rolex had, um, I don't know if it's the brains, but they, even they cheaped out on this sometimes, right? Um, what comes immediately to mind is the 14060M. There was two versions of, of the Rolex Submariner 14060. And there was uh, one which was called the two-liner and one which was called the four-liner. And this referred to the number of lines of text on the dial. Mm -hmm. The two-liner just said Submariner, and then it said the depth reading. The um, the four-liner added two additional lines of text, which was, of course, this um, superlative chronometer officially certified. Right. So basically, you would pay a few hundred dollars at the time extra to get a watch that was chronometer certified. Yeah. Um, did they do anything different with the movements? I highly doubt it. I'm assuming it's the same exact movement. Nothing changed. The only difference was they didn't pay cost to get those other ones chronometer certified. And that saved them some money. Therefore, they passed that savings on to the customer. Yeah. But nowadays, Rolex um, certifies every single Everything. watch they make. Yeah. So that's... Uh, All right. About a million watches. Yeah. So let me just hang in there because um, this obviously is a standard that, uh, let's say, Alang und Söhne, Glashütte Original, Nomos, all of these other watch companies from Germany, for example, could meet. They could meet these precision standards, but they would never get a chronometer certification from Kosk because they are not Swiss made. Obviously, then the Germans created their own chronometer standard. But in a very un-German yes. very un-German way, they just decided to copy the Swiss standard, more or less. So there is a couple of there's this different different positions, there's different temperatures, there's different shock ratings and other things that they are testing. And they are doing this in an observatory that was basically bought by Wempel, the jewelry company. And they actually yes, created familiar. that observatory. And it's un, it's in conjunction with the official bodies, like meteorological societies and other police, uh, the federal bodies, that actually have created this German standard. And there's a German industry norm as well for that. But there's one big change between the Swiss uh, standard and the German standard, is that the German standard uses the entire watch head to test. So the assembled watch is being tested. And this is still minus four plus six. Correct. Uh, okay. Except the band or the bracelet and the strap. So that's not being sent there. But the entire Well, that's watch... not going to affect the timekeeping of a watch at all. Correct. Right? So Correct. it's the head, completely assembled head, the, yeah. is what is going to, yeah. as I mentioned, you know, putting a movement in a case will have an effect on timekeeping, 100%. Oh, yes. So anyhow, so that's, that's, that's what they do. And that's the German chronometer standard. Now, so so, what did the Swiss do to retaliate? Yeah, well, I don't know if it's if it's the Swiss in general or if it is um, one specific brand. I think since Rolex has its standard of superlative chronometer, um, and as you know, Tudor is the the baby brand had also a guarantee. They said, okay, all our watches are also, or most of their watches are chronometer certified. I think maybe all of them, right? I think it's all of them. Anyhow, so I think so. Yeah, even even so, the base movements, the ones that they have the ETA yeah, movements in, for instance, in the Royals, so, they're still certified. So, yeah. so, which means they're top grade. Yeah, exactly. Everything is so chronometer certified. So, but they also guarantee a tighter standard than the cost standard for their modern watches. They're saying minus two to plus four. That's on the. So it's not quite website. Rolex standard, but it's better than Still cost. Like two seconds off, or let's say fifty percent less than um, <laughs> at the Rolex superlative chronometer standard, but it doesn't have a name at Tudor. It's just like the Tudor guarantee. You can see that in the press material. They're saying, okay, like a Black Bay Fifty Eight Blue says, uh, this watch will go from minus two to plus four, and if it doesn't, send it to us, and we will regulate it so it does. That's our guarantee. Same as, as Rolex for five years, they guarantee that the watch will keep that time. My experience with my Rolexes and my Tudors is they are incredibly precise. They're also like, like your wife's plus minus a half a second, sometimes one second maximum. I think I had one Tudor that was one and a half seconds off. That's it. So most of them are really extremely precise, especially in the, couple, in the first couple of years. 
because I don't have them for such a long time. So very, very exciting. But then there was a whole other story. There was another company. Not keeping tutors. (laughs) But there was another company that produces a lot of watches. And that was once upon a time way ahead of Rolex. It was Omega. And Omega and the Swatch Group basically said, okay, we want also to have our own standard. And that's what we said in our which, which, uh, wrist check earlier. Mine has on its, my, my Omega on its, on its, on its uh, uh, dial, it says master chronometer. And this is the new um, standard that they have developed together with the Meteorological Institute of Switzerland and uh, I think some other institute. So they came up with a new standard. It's still an open standard. So all Swiss-made um, chronometer certified watches can join, which is very interesting. Metas, so the new, who have the, we the seen new master, do, do this? Wait a second, it's, it's the same as with Rolex. Every watch that has a, super, a superlative chronometer must be a chronometer first. So it is a COSC certified movement that is then uh, tested to superlative um, uh, requirements. To master, masters. Yeah, wait. By Rolex, Rolex is superlative, is Rolex. exactly. But for Metas, yes. it's the same thing. It's a precondition. You cannot get your Metas watch certified if it's not first run through the COSC certification. Chronometer. So the uh, and yes, Metas correct. does the same as a German chronometer standard, testing the entire assembled watch. So that means first you send your watch your your watch to COSC, and you have to pay for that. You wait for fifteen days. Watch comes back. And then you put it in the in the in the in the case, and then you do your own tests or the, the Metas test. The Metas organization also has um, testing facilities. But if you are a big enough watch company, then you can basically create like an implant. So Metas will have a specific amount of a, a small lab in your factory that your people, your employees, are not allowed to go in, which is basically sealed off. There's only Metas employ, uh, Metas employees there, and they will then test their wa- the watches there. So you don't have to send your watches across the country, because that's also one of the things that is a bit of a challenge, of course, from an insurance perspective, also from a from a just logistical perspective, is that you have to send if you are creating, let's say, five hundred thousand watches a year, and some of them are made of very precious metals and with diamonds and all of this stuff. And you have to just constantly ferry them back and forth between the testing institute and your factory in order to then distribute them. It's a bit of a pain. So they decided that... I can imagine. Yeah, so that, that yeah, yeah. the fully assembled watches don't have to travel. So you have your own, basically your own lab, your, uh, your own uh, lab inside your own factory, on your factory grounds, let's say it this way, in, on your factory grounds. But it is run and operated by only Meta's employees and is still open to scrutiny. Unlike the superlative chronometer standard, which is run by Rolex employees and has no outside scrutiny applied. So for a lot of people, they're saying, well, superlative chronometer testing is a joke because it's a self-certificate, right? Well, Met- exactly, Metas I can give myself not. a certificate. <laughs> yes. Exactly, and Metas yes. is... is... Proper, but okay. okay. Anyhow, so, so let, let's these talk are the differences. So Metas, so Metas does a couple of things more than uh, than than what Cosc does. And um, first of all, from the most obvious one is of course the uh, the rating that it's from zero to five seconds a day, from zero to plus five. That is what um, your deviation, average daily chronometric precision of the watch should be, right? Zero to five. So, given this, why, why, why do you think they went zero to plus five? Actually, it's zero to six, but it's uh, that's that's what it says in my certificate for my watch because that's one of the things that Metas also does. They, you must be able to get your chronometer certification and 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 all the testing results. They actually produce, give them to you, which is very nice. Um, with Omega and other manufacturers that do that testing they allow you to enter your serial number and your watch model and in on the website and then you can see exactly your watch's results during the test and i'm happy to disclose mine so my watch for example has my omega 
CMOS 300M has an average daily chronometric precision of 4.3 seconds a day. That was the result of my test. The test limits were 0 to 6. It passed. It wouldn't have passed the, superla the superlative test, for example. So my watch has it would have failed the superlative chronometer test from Rolex, but has, has passed the, uh, the test of, of, of Metas. So it's about four and a half but, but seconds a day this, fast, this watch. But this means, once mm. again, remember, Metas, zero to five seconds. Correct. Superlative chronometer, yeah. minus two to plus two, right? So we have to start wondering, is there a reason that they selected these ranges? Yes. I think um, when I talk to you about the other ranges, then I think it makes all sense, right? So obviously, Omega was very involved in this creating of the standard. So the power reserve has to be a minimum of 55 hours, right? Which many, many watches uh, uh, in Rolex, for instance, are, are not. Yeah. Right? Rolex still has 48-hour movements. Yeah. Well, yeah. Interestingly. Yeah. Um, some of the smaller ones, exactly, yeah. Correct. Um, yeah. Anyhow, so you have to have that. You have to have the exposure to one and a half Tesla or 15,000 Gauss of magnetic field, and you still have uh -huh. to have that movement working in the same, um, with the same precision. So it still has to function. It's called the function of chronometer-certified movement during exposure to 15,000 Gauss magnetic field. Then it has to do the deviation of the daily chronometric precision after the exposure should not be higher than five seconds a day to your normal function. This is, says here yeah, for my watch, 0 0.4 seconds per day. Then, of course, the average chronometric precision, the power reserve, the deviation in the six, six positions. But, but let me six positions mention this as well. To five. One thing, mm -hmm. and it says the six positions. Yes. Uh, dial up, dial down, crown up, crown down, crown right, crown left. So it does say a number of things, um, which, remember, uh, cost only does five of these. And be, yeah. But the big thing here, here's what I'm seeing that, that no, you have not mentioned yeah. yet, which is, I think is very, very important is that they test the watch at 100% full wind and then at 33% power. That's the power. next one. So, so the deviation of chronometric position in six positions does that as well. But there you have um, a distant, a, 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 a delta between these from zero to 14 seconds per day. So that means between the fastest position and the slowest positions, you, you should have between zero and 14 seconds a day. That's the maximum deviation you can have to pass. Of course, usually it's much, much, much smaller. So in my case, my watch, it's point two, uh, sorry, 2.3 seconds per day between the slowest position and the <laughs> fastest position. So that's pretty good. Um, and then the next one, that's, that's exactly what you said, the deviation of the chronometric precision between a fully charged watch and a watch with only 33% of power reserve should be also between yeah, zero and, and the 10 keen seconds viewer... a day. Only. And the keen listener yeah. would, would say, why does that matter? Um, I just want to point out the fact that, of course, when you are dealing with a watch yeah. that's fully wound, imagine a spring that's under full compression. It's going to have the most kick yeah. when it's fully compressed. At the very end of its release, that's when you're going to lose power, right? Losing mm -hmm. power means that your regulation is also going to be not as great. So this is why it's important to test yeah. both. So, so the, the balance wheel might not swing as hard and then swing as far. So because you're of the lack of power that is being put into it from the mainspring. Yeah, exactly. So that could really lead exactly. to faster or slower. Exactly. Working. But most of the times, I mean, uh, when you wear an automatic watch and it's your only watch and you wear it every day, it keeps on being mostly fully charged. Right, because you're constantly wearing it and the movement of your wrist charges uh, your mainspring, thanks to the rotor running around. Um, and this is isochronism, it's called, when it's the watch is actually going worse when it's not fully wound, is being tested as well. And it can only be a maximum of 10 seconds a day fast doing this. And between so 100 this is and very, 30. very complicated. Yeah. This is not a very easy... No. Um, so that's why you know. we all boil it down to this zero to five, right? But in fact, it's actually 
a lot of different tests and a lot of different other things. Same as the water resistance is tested, which is also something that nobody else tests, of course. If you only test the movement, you can't test the water, water resistant, right? So that's yes. also something that is tested there. Um, I'm not sure if they're testing um, a specific depth rating or if they're just testing the depth rating that you're promising and saying, okay, that is what you promised and this is kept. I'm not so sure about that. But it says for mine yeah. that it's 300 meters, water resistance passed. So good. So my watch obviously passed because it was on sale. It would not go on sale if it didn't pass, right? But the thing is, um, you can actually see your test results on the website and you can even get them, I think, if you want to uh, print it out and send to you if you if you if you like which that. is super cool yeah, yeah it's very nice very nice so that's the metas certification and i think metas and the master chronometer that you can then put on your watch is what omega was after though it's not a proprietary test for omega only every swiss watch company can can come and join that which i think is is smarter to do right how are you going to compare it to yourself as we said with exactly, rolex because they're the is... only ones giving out superlative chronometer yeah. By that logic, they could put whatever they want on the dial. Yeah. Uh, but Metas has some substance. Yeah, yeah. We know that there's some, you know, now, of course, Tudor is getting their hands or feet wet with these Metas uh, certifications as well. And the first Metas uh, Tudor that came out was the Black Base Ceramic. Mm -hmm. And now they just released at Watches and Wonders and said that now the larger 41 millimeter Black Base with the burgundy bezels are also going to be meta certified. So that to me says yeah. it gives me more confidence in a company. Absolutely. Saying that a third party external, you no, know, there's no uh, hidden interests or um, conflict of interest, right? With Rolex saying no, all of our watches are great. Um, as, as you know, uh, they possibly could. Um, so this means that there is a little bit of, of oversight. Yeah, which that is, is 100% of course, right. It's open, uh, needed. it's an open standard, it's transparent. Superlative, we don't know much except the minus two, plus two. There's a couple of things on the website that they say they do, but Rolex can also change the superlative standard at any time without, you know, telling anybody. Any oversight. Yeah, exactly. So exactly. Metas is transparent, it's open, it's there, it's, um, it's open to scrutiny. Um, it's an independent testing organization. The body of, of testing that is, is independent. So it's very nice. So, all right, we've talked Swiss, we've talked... German. Mm -hmm. um, lastly, I do want to mention, uh, you know, the other country that watches tend to come from is Japan, right? Yeah. So, so let's compare these standards to what Grand Seiko is producing, because of course, Grand Seiko is the pinnacle of Japanese watchmaking. Uh, you know, of course, we can go above it as well with with Credor, but let's not go there right now. Let's compare like for like Omega, Rolex, Grand Seiko. So, for their mechanical movements, they're quoting plus eight minus one which is, in essence, a nine-second window. Right. If you look at COSC, mm -hmm. they're minus four plus six, which is a 10-second window. Mm -hmm. So they are technically claiming to be better than um, than COSC certifications, yeah. but they're, of course, uh, slightly different in, in how they uh, accomplish that. Um, once again, I do want to point out, they're biased towards the plus side. And why is it so important that we're biasing our movements towards the plus side and not the minus side? Um, and I, I, I want to ha hazard a guess at this and say it's because you would rather have your watch run fast than slow. Absolutely. If you can imagine, if I am diving, right? I'm, I'm a professional diver and I'm diving underwater and I have X amount of air left in my tank and I'm using my watch to time that, if it runs fast... I come up earlier. Correct. And I still have air left, left in my tank. If it's running slower and I'm losing time, then I'm miscalculating how much air I actually have. So if I say I have 30 minutes of air in my tank um, and I set my watch, okay, I have 30 minutes, start counting. Mm -hmm. And your 30 minutes is actually equating to, let's say, 40 minutes in real life. You're dead. So biasing to the positive side is generally more... Safe. Oh yeah, absolutely. Then you, you towards want to the rather negative. be early to a meeting or to anything. I mean, generally exactly. faster is better than slower. It depends. I mean, there's exceptions to that as well. <laughs> but, but well, yeah. Once again, I'm, I'm hazarding a guess here. Yeah. This is why you know Metas and 
Grand Seiko is biasing. Exactly. And that's very uh, towards good. The I, I like this personally a lot because I, I also, I do not like um, watches that go slow. Um, so now, and then the other two types of movements they make, of course, let's talk um, spring drive, which of course is uh, Grand Seiko's proprietary um, half quartz, half mechanical movement. Um, they claim that to be plus minus 15 seconds per month. Which is the exact same as my grand um, as my G Shock that I'm wearing right now, the so same as what G Shock claims. Mm -hmm. But uh, my G Shock, of course, is pure quartz. A spring drive is half quartz, half mechanical. So let's talk about Grand Seiko pure quartz, a regular quartz watch. Once again, my quartz Casio is plus minus 15 seconds per day, mm -hmm. or sorry, per month, per month. Um, Grand Seiko Quartz is plus minus 10 seconds per year. Yeah. Which is ridiculous. Right. I mean, that is that is insane yeah. precision. This, these are these are thermocompensated quartz watches and they are um incredibly um over engineered. They right? react the, heat, you yeah. know, at different temperatures. They measure the temperature of your of of the movement of the watch um I think a thousand times a day and then adjust their timekeeping to it because the quartz crystals swing slightly different depending on the temperature and that's that's what they're compensating for. And if you have a star Which on is, the dial of your Grand Seiko on the front, then it's regulated to plus minus five seconds a year. On your quartz, which is very, very some limited cool. editions yep. have that, and um, there's only one manufacturer who does. I think, I mean, there's the Longines also does the very high precision watches that also keep time plus minus five seconds a year. So they have done that. As they well. also have the star. Uh, no, no, Longines. Sorry, that's a Swiss company, so no, no star. No, no, but Longines also has a star. Oh, right, yeah, on, okay. on some of their. You know, on their VHP watches, or even right? five stars on their Spirit Line, right? Whoa. <laughs> or, yes. No, I, I, I remember there on the VHP, which is the very high precision yeah. uh, watch. Yeah, I had one. They of had, these, but I, I didn't was, know that there was a star. Maybe there was. No, 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 no star. The star is zero, right? Yeah. It's on the Heritage. And, uh, anyhow, which I guess has nothing to do with anything, but no, there's some five star um, rating that they gave themselves. Who knows? <laughs> so it's it's similar to the stars on the back of an Omega constellation, right? Yeah. Which uh, I think seven stars or eight stars on the back of the Omega constellation for the eight times or seven seven or eight times they won the Swiss chronometer the trials. Which trials. Is kind of yeah, cool. exactly. Observatory trials, and there's a picture of an observatory on the back Correct. as well. Correct, and the constellation. Um, yeah, because they always won with the constellation. The constellation was the flagship yeah. um, that they test their new movements out in, yeah. and. Uh, Hence why they have it. All yeah. Right. So okay. Coming, so we yeah, talked com, about timekeeping. Com, coming back to our standards, right? Because what we what we also have is um, we have watches that are not even chronometer certified. The the big, how do you call that? The, the big the the holy trinity of watchmaking. You know, Audemars Piguet, Piguet, Patek Philippe, and Vacheron Constantin. They all are not necessarily chronometer certified watches. They have done something different. They have in the past used the uh, Geneva Seal um, certification, which is a bit of a different. It's an old one. It's it's actually I think it's predating predating Kosk, right? Uh, because this this is, is a very old standard, and um, they have used the Geneva Seal as a standard. Uh, but again. The Geneva seal is also a standard that does not um, test the entire movement. Uh, sorry, test the entire watch, only test the movement. So the Geneva seal is based on some aesthetics. It has to be all hand assembled, handmade, hand uh, finished, and all of these little little details. And of course, it has to have a specific precision rating. But there's a lot of aesthetic things in this as well. But recently, Patek Philippe has decided to not actually expose their watches to the Geneva seal testing anymore because they also said like, hey, a bit like Rolex, saying like, well, it's not meaningful enough for us anymore. I believe AP also doesn't do it anymore, yeah. right? It's, it's only Vacheron. Vacheron still does it and a couple of other brands still do it. So there's there's, there's plenty of... Uh, Cartier, Cartier um, if I remember correctly, even, Cartier does it, uh, Roger Dubuis, Chopard, yeah. um, 
and which is weird. Louis Vuitton does it. Yeah. I'm assuming not on all watches, yeah, but and, and, they have done yeah, it. Yeah, Chopin also has a different which, different seal as well. They have the Geneva seal, but they also have another another one that they are actually heavily involved in. And the CEO of the Fleurier. Chopin is actually in the committee of that as well. But yeah, the Fleurier Quality Foundation seal. It's a different one. I'm getting into that now. But anyhow, so the, the, the Patek Philippe seal that they have created is, of course, again, another self-certification, right? And they are exactly testing the same in, the encased movement, right? Doing the entire manufacturing process, which makes more sense as a manufacturer because you can actually see if something goes wrong during the production until on the other side you would test the, the, the final movement already. Right, I mean the sorry, the final watch, like with Metas. What if it doesn't? Mm -hmm. If it doesn't? Um, if it, that it doesn't pass, what do you do with this watch? Right, you have to go back, disassemble the watch, find the reason why it is not working. It's a it's a pain. It's a problem. Patek Philippe says, well, we are testing it during the phases of the manufacturing process to guarantee that it basically gets the seal in the end, and we figure out certain things prior to to actually finishing the watch and then of course fin um, testing the watch once it's finished so they're doing minus three to plus two seconds right for any uh -huh. calibers that are bigger than 20 millimeters and for calibers that are smaller than 20 millimeters they must they say minus five to plus four which is very interesting because what you just said about all of these other standards being more on the faster side rather than being on the slower side the Patek seal is actually um, trend, yeah, trending percent. to the to the minus side. Weird. It's very interesting. Very weird. And I yeah, don't know why, but it is like that, right? And then that the tennis, of course, test of, of course the finished watch as well in this real world, con, um, you know, conditions and all of these things. And then you get the Geneva seal. The, uh, sorry, the, the Patek but, but seal. Sorry. The Patek yeah. seal. So let's talk. Let's talk um, because we've mentioned a lot about you know movement. Uh, uh, certifying the movements yeah. work order, right? But we haven't mentioned anything about it being beautiful, Correct. right? How can one certify like the Geneva seal, which is for how a watch looks? So I'm looking at the Geneva seal standards right now. Mm -hmm. And I just want to read the, the, the readers, read for the viewers, the, the listeners, sorry, the listeners, um, what some of these standards are, because they are ridiculous. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to read you a few random ones. Entire movement must be jeweled with ruby jewels set in polished holes. Correct. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, where's another good one? Uh, in wheel assemblies, the pivot shanks and the faces of the pinion leaves must be polished. Mm -hmm. Good to know. Yeah, these are... Um, there's a lot of... Is there yeah. really, uh, the Go ratchet on. and crown wheels should be finished in accordance with registered patterns. So they're telling you what patterns you can use. Yeah, Cote de Genève. And Wire other springs things, uh, are not something. allowed. Yeah. So lots of things here, uh, you know, about the finishing of a movement. There's a lot of so, rigor. Um, and, 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 and there's one. And, yeah, best practices basically for, for this kind yeah, of. And then there's one. High end watches. One line here, because we mentioned this. This has nothing to do with cost certification. And article number seven in Geneva Seal says, the watches having successfully undergone rates tests can claim title chronometer. Yep. So once again, nothing to do with anything, right? You have to do that separately if you want chronometer yep. certification. Correct. That's separate, right? These are once again, mostly there for, um, for how well the watch is finished. And I believe they started something, 1886 was the Geneva seal. So this is, is quite an old tradition. So let me, let's quickly talk about the, the, the one of the newest tests. I mean, together with Metas, there's the Fleurier Quality Foundation. And they have the same mm -hmm. um, aesthetic exclusivity, the quality of the finish. They have another rule that you have to manufacture your watch 100% in Switzerland, which is and, also and something. And for those of you that don't know, mm -hmm. currently the, the, rule, the law states in order to put Swiss made on a watch, you have to have 60% of the value Being produced of the watch coming from Switzerland. Switzerland. Yeah. yeah, so it's not 60% of the watch. Yeah. 
it's 60% of the value so be, be, of the being watch. a devil's advocate, we could say if I put if I buy a movement one diamond if I buy a movement from China, for example, right? Or from any other country, I get it to Switzerland, but I put a very nicely and very expensive solid gold rotor on it that is more than 60% Swiss gold. of the yeah, it, it's 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 more, yeah. you know, it's from Swiss a value man. perspective. And I assemble this with a very expensive watchmaker in Switzerland and saying, like, okay, 60% of the value of the watch was created in Switzerland, it would pass. I would love to see this with like a plastic crappy movement. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like a swatch with a plastic Should quartz be quite movement. Easy then, you put yeah, a, actually. <laughs> some nice uh, you know, you put a diamond on it that's finished yeah. in, in there. In Switzerland, and all of a sudden, it is Swiss made. Yeah, so this 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 Fleurier standard is is basically hundred percent manufactured in in Switzerland, uh, and they go through the, a lot of these details of of what that actually means, right? How, how it's even also controlled. Uh, again, this this Fleurier standard is not that you pro get every watch into a testing. There is. Um, a kind of a significant statistics test, right? So depending on how many watches you create, like say 50 watches, you have to only give five to testing, right? Not all 50. Yes. So this is a bit of a, not every watch is tested like in Metas or Kosk, right? So that that's that. And of course, but you have the quality of the finish that you have to do. You have to allow these inspectors to check your suppliers and yourself, your own factories, access at any time so they can actually see if you're really following the standards, right? So there is a bit of scrutiny possible. Um, you have to have a COSC certified movement as well. So like Metas, they they require you to have the movement already COSC certified before you even can qualify for the rest. And then, of course, you have to do all of the other durability testing, aesthetic testing. And then they have the flurry test, precision testing, that is also done to that statistical um, significant amount of watches based on how many you're going to produce. And that is a 24-hour test. It's, it's relatively small, um, a sh short from, from given the other tests that take up to two or three weeks. Or if you have JLC, we, have, we haven't mentioned JLC. It just comes to my mind. They do a 1,000-hour test. 1,000-hour master control. So, and then 1,000 hours are how many... How many days? 1,000 hours. That is 41 days. So a quality control that actually yes. takes 41 days. Anyhow, so yeah, Flurry, the Flurry test simulator that they use is uh, 24 hours. It um, tests watching uh, the watch in different positions, also in different activities, activity levels, doing nothing, doing a lot of activity and blah, blah, blah. And it should fall in the range from zero to five seconds a day, which we have heard before, right? Metas, yeah. exactly. So this is this is basically then the um, certification is called FQF, Le Haute Horlogerie Certifié. Certifié. Anyway, Lots of stuff going yeah. on. So that's basically uh, the certification that you can get as well. So there's a Patek seal that you can only get if you are Patek. The superlative that you can only get when you get Rolex, right? And then there are the open standards. Like Fleurier, uh, the FQF, like Metas like um um what did we have the last no uh, there was one more uh yeah the geneva seal but of course geneva the seal, geneva yeah. seal also and you, you have to be based in geneva so you can't be in the show on the thrones or no, whatever it's I called think you have to you, you have to make the watch somewhere there um or assemble it in the in the canton of geneva or something like that or in the same canton as geneva is located i'm not 100 percent sure but there's a lot of uh, it. And, uh -huh. and since all of the other standards already require you to have cost certified and cost certified only works with swiss movements means yeah you you might be a producer in france or even in japan but your movement has to be swiss in order to be officially a Swiss chronometer, right? <laughs> yeah. Same with, uh, I think, in, in the German chronometer movement testing, I'm not 100% sure if they only test German movement or if they're open to other countries and you could actually pass this test. I'm not so sure about that, if, if they have anything there. I have to look this up. But anyhow, these are the tests that, uh, that are in the world in order to get a watch 
chronometer tested and you cannot just write chronometer on the dial i have seen it before that some cheap quartz brands from some countries just put chronometer on the dial because they think it looks nice and they have no idea what it means but technically they could be asked to remove that and uh, uh, because that's you can't actually just put this on your watch it's a it's a it's a trademark well, but i think is once again these these uh uh, companies, you know, uh, the Swiss Meteorolog Meteorological Institute is not going to care about these, right? That's ultimately what it comes down to is they're just going to say, yeah, whatever, it's good enough. Yeah. Uh, we're not going to bother, um, you know, starting lawsuits with these no-name companies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So this is this is kind of the, the Dyson effect, right? Uh, we can talk about patents all day. So, um, but, you know, you have a certification if they're not a real competitor, if you're, you're not losing market share by having these people do it, it's not worth you um, getting into a legal matter with these companies. Absolutely. I, I, Especially I, these Chinese companies and things like this, it's not going to do anything. I totally agree. One thing I forgot to mention that I wanted to, to because you brought up the, the Grand Seiko quartz watches. Um, I think I mentioned there's one watch brand, Citizen, that actually has a plus minus one second a year movement. And then now actually even have an echo drive movement. These are usually, they're called Chronomaster, Citizen Chronomaster. They are available mostly exclusive for the Japanese market. Quite expensive, so two to $3,000. But these watches- For a quartz movement, yeah. yeah. It, but, and that's the big but, like the, like the Grand Seiko movements, they had until now, the challenge that you had to change the battery after like three to four years, right? The battery would be empty. <laughs> so you needed a new battery and that means you have to stop the movement, right? What, I mean, think about this. You have a movement that at the worst case goes five seconds fast a year. So after three years, it might be 15 seconds off. Worst case, right? Which usually doesn't yeah. happen. And then you have to stop the watch because you have to change the battery. So now Citizen has, has, has made their echo drive technology that they have. Also, Which is the solar, right? Yeah, exactly. Solar charging into their Chronomaster line. So now they have a watch that goes plus minus one second a year and it's solar solar uh, powered. So that means it can, if you expose it to light enough, run about 15 to 20 years until the battery might not have enough power anymore or might just die um, from old age rather than anything else. That in this, its entire lifetime would go a maximum of not even half a minute wrong, which is just crazy. absolutely mind blowing. Yeah, the, the the chronometer standard that we said before, COSC standard for quartz watches, basically. I, I said that it's it's up to it can have a average daily um, difference of zero point zero seven um, seconds per day, and while you think, well, that's not even a tenth of a second a day, right? But that means in a year, that's 25 and a half seconds. Yeah. So you can see already. And this is kind of what you see even, you know, with, with yeah, any watch. That's chronometers. Is, is, as, I, yeah. as, as I mentioned yeah. to you, my wife's watch was uh, plus 15, plus 15-ish seconds a day. Yeah. Well, in a month, that was, you know. That's, yeah, that's more than, that's more than a minute a, a week, right? So that's. In a month, you have a couple exactly. of minutes. So this is, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so this is the issue. Is is it's no a problem if you're not wearing the watch all the time. Yeah. But she was wearing the watch nonstop, and then you know, in a month, she was five five minutes fast. Yeah, that's that's not not, not and nice. then not not for a watch of this caliber, right? right? Or this price. Exactly. Exactly. And it, it was kind of annoying as well, right? Yeah. So you want to you have to, but it was super easy to fix it. So, but I also think this is when when you see that the the chronometer certification is. 25 seconds a year it can be off and still get a chronometer certification for a quartz watch and then you see uh, what grand seiko and citizen uh, an extension can do yeah it's, it, it's, it's insane um and the one the other thing that i wanted to mention here is um when i hear people saying like but even the cheapest quartz watch is more precise than your mechanical watch I hear this. That's very often. a lie. It is a lie. Yeah. I have mechanical watches and I have quartz watches where the quartz watch is worse. I have very cheap watches like, you know, the, the, the Casio FW91. 
Again, this depends on which temperature you actually store it, but it's in my drawer. And after a month or so, it can be off by sometimes more than half a minute or even a minute after a month or two yep. or three, right? And you think, hmm, some of my watches, my mechanical watches, would not be off by that much if they would be, you know, one or, or round. Exactly, exactly. So, I mean, once again, you're, yeah. you're comparing the crappiest quartz watch. Of course, or, or, with a very you know, expensive. To the best <laughs> mechanical watch. But my point which is, is, you know, once again, a hundred Durham watch compared to a yeah. you know, hundred thousand Durham watch. Exactly. But the, my point was that people are saying my cheap quartz watch is more precise than, you know, any mechanical watch. And that's not true. <laughs> yes, that is not true. Absolutely. Definitely. And now yeah. Omega with their new, uh, what is it, their new swan neck regulator is saying that um, you can adjust uh, in, in your regulation up to uh, 0.1 seconds increments. Yeah. So, um, I mean, we're getting even more precise. Yeah, with the spirit. Um, so, spirit. Or spirate, spirate, yes. Is, I have no idea how to pronounce it. But spirit, spirit um, mainspring, they will guarantee zero to plus two seconds, which is, of course, double the precision than the superlative chronometer from... But, well, right. once again, 0. <laughs> 0.1 second uh, adjustment. Yeah, so right? you, you can adjust... So that's the big thing here, exactly. ...into that area of between 0 and plus 2. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So it's, it's very... Fascinating I, I, times. They've only made one watch in, the same, in this line, right? Yeah. Which was the hideous Speedmaster, but nonetheless... There will uh, be more. There will be it, more. It'll be interesting. There will be more, as as they always do. And as, as, as Tudor, Tudor right. will also be, uh, has announced that they will, all of the new move, uh, watches will have meta certification. All of them. New watches that they will bring out. Yeah, I think it'll be interesting, it'll be interesting mm -hmm. to see what happens. Exactly. But, all right. I think on that bombshell, it's time to end. Yes. So we hope you've enjoyed our ramblings about plus minus Zero to five seconds a day. And you see what a bit um, of a mess the entire certification standards in the world are. <laughs> and just how big of a, uh, no, nerds we are to just have these numbers in the back of our mind all the time. <laughs> but um, it's interesting nonetheless, yeah. right? All these nuanced things are interesting to us at least. So um, once yeah, again, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. Follow us on Instagram at Loom Plotters. Message us. We're happy to take your feedback. Um, give us ideas whatever you want to hear about yes. let us know um, if you don't message us we cannot respond so um, we're not mind readers but uh, anyway uh, it was good chatting Ralph and, and likewise and, uh, we'll, thank you and we'll see you guys next week have a lovely day bye 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 bye